Last Sunday afternoon, as Carol and I were having lunch at home, we had an interesting discussion about last Sunday's service. The service, if you weren't here, was about the plight of refugees and migrants. Carol remarked, that was a challenging story for all ages, you told. If you weren't here, it was about a story. It was a story about the difficult life of a child who was also a refugee. I said to Carol, you're right. And just think, next week's sermon is about torture. <laughs> While last week's story was realistic, it was also a children's story, and I felt it was suitable. I will say that if any parent had a concern, I hope you will let me know. And if you read this week's notebook, you will know that an older child took last week's story and sermon to heart, and I shared her words with you. I hope you read those. Wonderful. As to the story for all ages this week, some might say I lightened up. The sermon today, not so much, but stay with me. It does have a good ending. And on March 20th, we will celebrate the wonder and beauty of spring. And on March 27th, we will celebrate Easter with the amazing words of Jesus. Actually, we will celebrate um, the message and the music of Jesus Christ Superstar. I hope you will be here. There will be two services at 9 and 11 on Sunday, March 27th, Easter Sunday. And so this week's sermon topic, Torture, it may appear that I picked it based on presidential politicking that has been in the news the last two weeks and certainly much longer than that. And yet, as Kathy has already suggested, I chose this topic 10 months ago before I went on sabbatical to Mexico City. If my sermon coincides with what is in the news, I like to say, well, that, that is the universe conspiring on my behalf. <laughs> I chose this topic for, because for me, as much as any issue I know, I think our belief about torture says a lot about who we are as a people. So let me speak about the political nature of my topic. I've not said this in a number of years, but I think it bears repeating. As a tax-exempt religious organization, we are permitted to speak on political issues from the pulpit. I am allowed to advocate as convincingly as I can for an issue based on my values and beliefs. That said, what I am not permitted to do is endorse any political candidate or political party. And so in preparing for this sermon, I've not reviewed the stand that various politicians or political parties have on this topic of torture. Okay, let's get to it. The day after I arrived in Mexico City to begin my sabbatical, I wanted to reorient myself to the city. A city. I'd been there before a couple of times. And so I went to the main square. It's called the Zocalo, looking, looking for a guided walking tour of the city center. I was approached by an official tour guide of Mexico City, and he said, there is a free tour today because the city, the government, is promoting tourism. Today's free tour is a free tour of our torture museum. I'm not making this up. Did he know that I was speaking about torture when I returned from sabbatical? Was the universe again conspiring on my behalf? As I considered his invitation and knowing that torture has been a hot topic for the last 15 years, if not longer, and believing that the United States had clearly lost its way on this character-defining issue, I wondered to myself, maybe there is a room in this museum dedicated to torture practiced in the United States. Maybe I could do some sermon prep while I'm here. I didn't take the tour because I suspected it was not meant to be educational, but rather for entertainment, appealing to our baser natures and a glorification of violence that is so prevalent in our society. Later, I learned that the museum was about torture from the 14th to 19th centuries. And from the displays on the outside of the building, which I saw months later, I think my suspicion was correct. It was more for entertainment than anything else. Before I delve into the substance of my topic, let me say that my ideas come primarily in response to the war on terror 
although what I have to say can equally be applicable to local law enforcement. Let me start with a simple dictionary definition of torture. It is the action or practice of inflicting severe pain on someone as a punishment or to force them to do or say something or for the pleasure of the person inflicting the pain. I don't even get to the second part of that definition, but that should be troubling if nothing else is troubling, that people do this for pleasure. I'm talking about very disturbing treatment of terrorists and suspected terrorists. And while I will let waterboarding be the poster child for to torture this morning, I am equally troubled with the many forms of torture I've heard described. In preparation for this sermon, I watched a video of the waterboarding of a former Navy SEAL. Carol noticed I was physically shaken after watching that video because this was no Hollywood simulation. And I will challenge anyone in this room to watch that video and say that waterboarding is not torture. Waterboarding is popular because it leaves no permanent physical damage and the victim does survive. And here, I think, is the beginning of an indictment against waterboarding and other modern forms of torture. If you hide behind an interrogation technique because it does not leave physical evidence, you are clearly not willing to be held accountable for your actions. This is why the pictures of torture and abuse that happened at Abu Ghraib prison in 2003 are so damning. The pictures don't lie. I find it mind-boggling that our leaders even discuss the severity of pain we can legitimately inflict. By analogy, it would, be, it would say it is legitimate to rob a bank as long as you don't take too much. It's like saying you can cheat on your partner as long as it's not too often. It's saying you can beat your spouse as long as it does not leave physical scars. If you are debating how much inflicted pain and fear you can legitimately get away with, you are already drowning in moral quicksand. Today we often hear mention not of torture but of enhanced interrogation techniques. How's that for a euphemism? It's as if giving it a less offensive name somehow legitimizes the action. Imagine this for a criminal defense. No, it wasn't bank robbery. It was a reallocation of bank funds. No, it wasn't extortion. It was consensus building. No, it wasn't sexual assault. It was a getting-to-know-you exercise. You simply cannot defend a practice by naming it something else. We have heard about secret prisons maintained by the United States, and many of them are in other nations where torture is acceptable or more acceptable. Hiding the crime makes it no less a crime. It's still bank robbery if you don't get caught. And it's still sexual assault even if no one reports a crime. If these moral arguments are not convincing, let me try a more rational argument. While living in Fredericksburg, Virginia, I heard the Reverend Bill Schultz, a Unitarian Universalist minister, former president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, former executive director of Amnesty International USA, make the case against torture at a lecture he gave at the University of Mary Washington. Schultz said, those who support torture do so with the following hypothetical situation. Suppose you have captured a known terrorist 
who you know has information about a terrorist attack that will kill 10,000 people in less than 24 hours. Would you then not, would not you then condone torture to justify saving 10,000 lives? Schultz first challenged the neatly orchestrated facts of the case as they have been laid out. Number one, that the terrorist has the information. Two, that you have no less than 24 hours to extract the information. Three, that torture will give you the information you need. Four, that no other option will tell you what you need to know. And five, that you will be able to stop the terrorist act. The facts can rarely, if ever, say, says Schultz, be established with such clarity and precision. As a consequence, Schultz will challenge the false dualism that without torture 10,000 people will die and with torture 10,000 lives will be saved. That with torture 10,000 lives will be saved. It simply cannot be established that torture is the only option and will have the desired outcome. It is also worth noting another salient point by Reverend Schultz the consequences of a decision to commit torture are also very uncertain and unclear. The consequences of committing torture. I wonder how many new terrorists we create as a result of the torture and abuse that occurred at Abu Ghraib. Oh, I can just imagine how that fed into the creation of new terrorists. There is so much conventional wisdom that speaks to Schultz's points. The ends do not justify the means. Inflicting torture is very short-sighted, and you will reap what you sow. From time to time, I think about my decision not to tour the torture museum in Mexico City. Despite my aversion, perhaps I should have taken the tour Perhaps it would have confirmed for me that as a civilized nation we have not come as far as I would have hoped. It gives me pause to think that the United States in its promotion of torture seems not to have progressed beyond the Middle Ages. The techniques are different and actually they're not so different. In the research... Tort waterboarding has been around for centuries. We've only got it a little more refined. So yes, some techniques are different. Today we have new rationalizations, but the barbarism remains the same. I need you to know that I love this country. I love our ideals. I love that we have made significant strides in our short history living up to those ideals. And if I did not love this country, I would not take the time to challenge us to continue in that forward direction. In a sermon I gave recently, I was asked to offer in my sermon some specific ways for members of Emerson to respond to the issues that I raise. Responding to the issue of torture is sometimes difficult, but I would like to mention two ways. One is to support organizations like Amnesty International, and the other is to write letters to the editor of local newspapers, especially since this is a hot topic. It's been in the news recently. Your letter should be very salient. But here is where my heart is right now, because this issue is much bigger than torture. For those who are new to Emerson, I want you to know that here at Emerson we recognize that we have been very focused on our own needs for a long time. And this building is a beautiful example of what we achieved. We're to be congratulated for that. But we also know here at Emerson, and you heard Dave Schemmel say it this morning, that we want to get outside these walls. 
We want to share our values. We want to make a difference in the community. Now, this may not be very modest, but I would love nothing better than for Emerson to have a reputation as a congregation that lives its values, not once a year, but on a regular or frequent basis, that we speak truth to power in what is happening right here in Cobb County, in Cherokee County, and other counties around us. This is much like what we do when we serve breakfast every month at Must Ministries to the Homeless. If Dave, as Dave said, right now we are putting the pieces in place to do just that. And I want you to understand what these pieces are. Whatever issue or issues we take on, it will not be because Jeff decided. It will not be because the Board of Trustees decided. That is not how we do things in Unitarian Universalism. The issue that we take on will happen because it has strong congregational buy-in. And congregational buy-in, and this is different than how we've done it in the past, congregational buy-in will not be determined by a vote. Congregational buy-in will be demonstrated by phenomenal congregation participation. This does not mean we will all do the same thing. Some may have a more public or activist role. Some may write letters. Some may use social media. Some may serve on committees here at Emerson to provide the important infrastructure. But we will all be working together. And so the very first thing you can do is put March 19th on your calendar. And I will ask you to make it a priority to be here at Emerson on Saturday, March 19th. And I will be bold enough to say that you may need to change your plans so that you can be here on March 19th. I don't think I've ever asked anyone to change their plans so they could be at an event at Emerson. But I'm doing so today. As I said just a minute ago, I have no interest in picking the topic for you. And the board is not picking the topic. That is not a recipe for success. The first step on March 19th will start a process. It will be the start of a process in, in which the congregation will choose our issue. It is when we come together physically in wide participation. It is when we come together emotionally as when we share from our hearts and our passions. And it is when we come together spiritually by sharing a vision of how to bring healing to our community that we can plant the seed that we will then nurture to life and as a congregation move boldly into the future. May it be so.